Welcome back. Um, the, the posters, the posters will uh, stay uh, also for the lunch break, so you can go on uh, the discussion during lunch. Um, and now we have the, the second lecture by Gus Evrand about uh, computational cosmology. Thank you, Pella. Uh, welcome back, everyone. Um, Today we'll open the box uh, that admits that the universe is made up of more than just collisionless dark matter. Um, so what we'll talk about, here's a kind of outline of where we'll go. Uh, we'll first motivate having um, additional fluid to model the explicitly the baryonic behavior by kind of showing how n-body techniques uh, have been used, have been essentially misused to understand structure on small scales associated with galaxies. So there are limits to what you can do with an n-body simulation, and we'll go there. Um, then we'll talk about what you need to do galaxy formation properly. And I should say here that my emphasis is going to be more or less on galaxy formation, although uh, there are um, a lot of kind of roots and tendrils that come out of, like, say, forming the Milky Way associated with, let's say, the Lyman Alpha Forest at high redshift, which I know that some of you are actually working on, uh, or associated with the first generation of stars that might form, or associated with 21 centimeter observations at redshifts of 10 or 20 uh, to come. So there's, uh, there's quite a bit of, uh, of association of baryonic physics that uh, on scales that, that I won't focus on. Uh, but, you know, we have one lecture, so there's only so much we can do. And galaxies are important. We live in one. Uh, so if understanding how we got here in the Milky Way is kind of where I'm going to be focused today. And then, as I mentioned, tomorrow we'll talk about collections of galaxies and clusters and, and move up to the high end of the mass scale. So as a result, I'll be focusing more or less on the kind of lower redshift universe, and I won't be talking about the first generation of stars that might form at, say, redshift of 30 or 50, although that's an extremely interesting topic. Uh, the good news, of course, is that by focusing on low redshift, we have lots and lots and lots of observational data. So uh, one punchline of all of this is that you know, we're struggling, as the simulation community is struggling, to match all of that complexity. We have uh, a ridiculous amount of observational data associated with galaxies, and there's no way we're going to match all of that with current technologies. But I'll show you that things are actually getting quite reasonably uh, quite reasonable in terms of their fidelity for kind of low order properties of making disk galaxies that kind of look like the Milky Way, which was a challenge as, as recently as say four or five years ago. That's now uh, kind of achieved with uh, a fairly high degree of fidelity as I'll show you in some movies from uh, simulations by Phil Hopkins and his group. Okay, so uh, then you know, we'll, I'll, I'll go through some of the methods that are, that are in use. Um, talk about some of the results with cooling and star formation focused on forming a Milky Way-like galaxy. Take a brief look inside the ENSO code just to kind of give you a sense of what, you know, what are the gears and wheels inside of such a code. Um, and then talk, finish out by looking at some recent important papers that bring together multiple codes with the same physics and same initial conditions and compare results. And that's kind of a verification stage uh, that uh, these codes need to uh, undergo, um, and that work is, is important and ongoing. And then we'll try to summarize all of this and set up for tomorrow. Okay, so the goal of, uh, like I said, with the focus today, the goal is to make things that look like this in your computer. Uh, these are uh, Hubble Space Telescope Treasury images of nearby galaxies, and you can see a lot of, uh, a lot of interesting phenomenology and features. This guy, for example, is presumably uh, the result of a head-on merger, a merger happening along the line of sight where the stars are kind of shockwave, uh, gravitationally induced by a high-velocity encounter with a satellite that merged in, essentially in its core. That's really cool. So that's a transient phenomenon. Another transient phenomenon are things like this. Uh, and then, of course, you have dust lanes and beautiful grand design spirals. And then you also have uh, the rest of the Hubble sequence, most of which, because balls of stars aren't that exciting for people to see, there aren't that many. Well, here's the Sombrero galaxy, I think. That's got a big uh, bulge to it, but it's not quite um, an elliptical galaxy. But you know, there's our elliptical galaxies, there's spiral galaxies, there's are regulars, there's the whole Hubble sequence to try to figure out. So let's try to motivate um, doing two ex fluids explicitly by taking a look at some recent, relatively recent work of pushing n-body simulations to essentially the limit. Um, I mentioned last time that there are subhalos within halos, and that, that halos form through hierarchical merging. Well, 
when you store uh, results from your simulation, store snapshots, you can go in, do halo finding at each snapshot. By having identifications of every particle, you can essentially do Lagrangian tracing of you know, a structure present at redshift 10, where is it at redshift two? You can, where, are all, where are all of those particles? We can do that, we can trace that. And so you can trace the evolution of the merger history of a particular halo and generate diagrams like this. Right? These are diagrams where the x-axis is not meaningful. The location along the x-axis is just a, uh, I think sometimes these are called den dendrite diagrams or, or such, but there's basically a tree, hierarchical tree, where time um, runs upward on the graph. And for example, this is the largest halo to form at low redshift. All of these halos are in a FOF, a friends of friends environment, but then they're identified using spherical overdensity as a secondary step. So the FOF group contains this halo and a bunch of other halos over here at redshift of zero. Now, how did, the, how did this halo come to be? Well, it has a main progenitor track that goes back as you go backward in time along the green route here, but uh, as you move the clock forward in time, there's mergers, right? A little halo forms here, merges into a larger halo here, which hangs around uh, until it finally merges with the main progenitor group here and ends up as part of the main uh, halo at, at redshift of zero. Okay, so the, we, can, we can analyze the, the merger histories and generate these so-called merger trees um, and use them to uh, sort of assign starlight to the substructures in the halo at the redshift of zero. That's the, that's the game. People have done this for a, a, a while. This was a relatively recent work by uh, Gabriel De Lucia in, in uh, 2006. But back in, um, uh, sorry, that's on the next slide, what I'm going to talk about from 1999. So th this has led to uh, this notion of what's called subhalo uh, assignment matching, where you look at that merger tree um, and you identify all progenitors. You tag each progenitor with the maximum circular velocity, which is just GM over R maximized in, in, in your profile as a function of radius. Uh, didn't talk about that much yesterday, but you have a density profile. You can integrate that density profile to get an enclosed mass, divide by radius, and you get a circular velocity curve. The peak of that circular velocity curve is kind of a tag that you can put on each one of these subhalos. And that peak of the circular velocity curve, essentially through empirical observations, relates to the luminosity of systems. We know in low redshift observations of dwarf and, and normal galaxies that there are relations, that scaling relations between circular velocity and luminosity, and you're kind of taking advantage of that empirical information to assign luminosity to a subhalo given its peak uh, circular velocity. When you do that, so this, this technique has been around for about a decade, and here's an example of modeling galaxies in the Sloan Digital Sky Survey by Charlie Conroy and collaborators from 2006. And all I did was take an n-body simulation and do this kind of tagging, and then assign luminosities to the subhalos at redshift of, at low redshift, appropriate for Sloan. Sloan Digital Sky Survey uh, contains galaxies out to about redshift of 0.1. So they would take, say, a snapshot of a simulation at redshift 0.1, do this assignment, and then do things like measure properties. So they can measure things like the angular correlation function, the excess probability of finding a galaxy in angle theta away from a given galaxy. And you can do that for galaxies to find above given luminosity limits. And what's shown here are luminosity limits at the bright end, uh, visual magnitudes brighter than minus 21, and then going down to the faint end, minus 18. And uh, what's shown here are um, the uh, data from uh, the simulations. Let's see, the, from the simulations are the solid lines. The Sloan, actual Sloan data are the circles. So these are not fits. This, the prediction is the solid line from the simulations. And the actual measurements in the data are the points. And you can see that it's, it's like magic. It just works, right? Works perfectly to match the correlation function. Um, this, the dotted line here is the dark matter correlation function, which is constant. So this thin dotted line is the same in all panels. What you can see is that the brightest galaxies are more strongly correlated, the same way that high peaks in a density, Gaussian random field density, people, density field are more strongly correlated. So that makes sense. On the other hand, low amplitude peaks are less correlated in, than in general. Okay. So that method uh, uh, seemed to work extremely well. It makes a prediction, 
Here is essentially this halo occupation distribution, which I briefly uh, will, will mention uh, going on, which is the, just the mean number of galaxies above, say, these luminosity limits, that's the different lines, as a function of halo mass at, reg at a fixed redshift, 0.1. And what you can see is that at the bright end, you need a pretty high mass halo to form a single galaxy. And then as you go up in mass, you have more and more of them. These are groups of galaxies now. And then clusters would be out here at 10 to the 14, 10 to the 15, right? So here, yeah, here is kind of the cluster mass scale. As you go down in luminosity, you're finding that you have of order 100 galaxies in these halos at, reg at low redshift. Yes, question? So uh, w I, the question is why use an angular correlation yeah. ver versus a three-dimensional spatial correlation? Um, because the angular correlation function you can apply to the photometric samples where you don't know the redshift. Uh, it, you need to know the redshift in order to do the 3D version. And the 3D version actually has been done now uh, for uh, the brighter spectroscopic sample. Um, this uh, approach uh, was kind of early in the Sloan survey, 2005, 2006, so it was easier to do back, back in 2006. And also, you can push it to fainter magnitudes. You can go down to this magnitude, which are, uh, the Sloan spectroscopic limit, if I remember correctly, uh, wouldn't take you to, uh, to minus 18. It's uh, something like minus 20. And, and that's, uh, so you can only do the bright part of uh, the correlation function in three dimensions. Thank you. Okay, so yeah, so, so this is essentially now a, a prediction coming out of the model, which says that there's kind of a minimum mass scale above which you, which you need to reach in order to form a galaxy of a certain brightness. And then as you go to higher and higher masses, you just accrete more and more of these uh, galaxies of that, of that luminosity. Okay, so, so that approach um, was you know, applied kind of to, to understand the correlation function of brighter galaxies. But it was pushed maybe a little too hard to understand the structure of satellite galaxies around the Milky Way. So these satellite galaxies uh, have been known. I mentioned the LMC and, and SMC, the Large and Small Magellanic Clouds. But there are other satellite galaxies that, that are known around the Milky Way. Um, and in 1999, there weren't that many known. Um, so what I'm showing you here is the cumul cumulative number as a function of essentially luminosity, but again, phrased in terms of circular uh, circular velocity for these satellite galaxies around the Milky Way and also Andromeda, because Andromeda, our nearest neighbor, you can also see these, these systems. And these are very, very faint systems. These might contain something on the order of 10 to the 8 or 10 to the 7 stars in them. They're, they're actually very, very small. Right? Um, the observations are these points. The predictions from simulations of the day were here. And as you can see, as we go down to very faint systems, low circular velocities around uh, 30 kilometers per second or lower, the expectations from the simulations doing this subhalo assignment matching approach were such that we should have seen many, many more times, as, uh, like factor five more uh, satellite galaxies around the Milky Way and Andromeda than are observed. So that was a problem, and the question was, you know, where are all the missing satellite galaxies? And that became kind of a crisis for Lambda CDM, if you will. And there was a whole bunch of literature that was published since that time on, on solving this crisis. There was a related problem called the too big to fail problem. Uh, Michael Boylan Kirchen uh, published a paper in 2011. Uh, uh, shown here is a graph of um, the maximum circular velocity uh, versus uh, radius, uh, the size of the, of the system. And the Milky Way systems kind of follow this gray band here. And the point was that at a given size, there was a, the systems were too dense in the simulations. They have a too high a circular velocity at a given size compared to observations. Um, and so these were issues that uh, have been around for a while that, that troubled people. And, and, and there was some concern that maybe Lambda CDM on very small scales might be wrong. Um, but as we'll see at the end of the lecture, it turns out that baryon physics helps explain these problems. Uh, that we were pushing the n-body simulation, uh, pushing the sub-halo assignment matching technique in particular, um, and relying on uh, results from a single fluid simulation when, in fact, you needed multi-fluid physics in order to get the right answer. OK, so let's talk about galaxy formation in a cosmological context now. Here's a, a graph that uh, I've been showing for a while. 
that kind of gives you a sense of, a, it's like a flow chart for galaxy formation, uh, the essential ingredients. Um, you start with quantum noise in the early universe. Inflation gives you wiggles. Those wiggles are small amplitude, sets up everything. So I love to say, you know, everything in the universe is amplified noise. It explains a lot. You know, Donald Trump explains a lot, right? It's all amplified quantum noise. Uh, so, um, and then, of course, we amplify by gravity, and that's captured well by n-body simulations, right? So you go from 10 to the minus 5 to, you know, de over densities in the, in the core of our galaxy. You know, obviously, we're, we're 10 to the 27 times more dense than the universe on average in this room, you know? So uh, we achieve very high density. We're very... And the way we got there, the way we got to that level of uh, density contrast is because the baryons have this ability to separate themselves from the dark matter through radiative cooling. So uh, you fall into this box here where baryons se get separated from the dark matter. The dark matter is collisionless. It, you know, in the standard WIMP model, doesn't interact with radiation, so it's, 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 it thermalizes through random motions, as we saw yesterday, but can't cool. You know, th that, that energy is trapped in it, and your system is, in principle, uh, equilibrated and will hang around for the rest of the universe. So you've got this halo, but inside that halo, the baryons can shock heat. They can heat up. But the medium typically is optically thin, and baryons do interact with the radiation field. So every time you know, you, an electron scatters off a proton, there's a little photon that gets generated in remstrahling, and it can escape the system. And that escaping the system carries away energy. That's a little bit of energy, yeah, but there's a lot of electrons and a lot of time, and you just wait, and you can cool. You can let the, let the gas cool. Uh, th that means it'll shrink. The pressure support will, will, will be lost, and it will, and it will shrink. Uh, down into the bottom of the potential well. And, and here I have a kind of characteristic, used to be a black box for representing star formation and black hole formation and, and feedback. I think it's, be as you'll, we'll see today, it's becoming grayer. It's not quite white. It's not quite, you know, completely transparent and understood, but it used to be very opaque. And, and at least we're getting better at, at handling it. Um, and, and then, uh, this is a little faint, but at the end you get a little galaxy sitting at the bottom of, the, uh, of a dark matter halo. All right, now this picture has been in place for, you know, certainly o almost as long as I've been on the planet and, and certainly longer than most of you have been on the planet, right? So uh, it all goes back to a paper which, if you read it today, it's kind of, you know, it makes your head scratch a little bit. Some of the graphs in it and stuff are not all that illuminating. But um, the, the abstract is perfect. The abstract is exactly what the model is today. You know, essentially... Uh, the entire luminous content of galaxies results from the cooling and fragmentation of residual gas within the transient potential wells provided by the dark matter. Boom. That's it. You know, that's what it is. And these guys put that together back in the day and are still with us, uh, still working on the problem. It's not so. All right. Now, what does it mean to then, you know, okay, that, that's a nice theoretical framework. What does it mean to get real? You know, what does it mean to actually form, make those HST pictures in, in a synthetic, in a computer? For real. Well, we have a laundry list that we put up about the physics that we need. What does that laundry list look like? Uh, there's a lot of stuff on here. There are entire subfields of astrophysics devoted to a bullet point here. Um, you know, hundreds of people around the planet working on it. So, so this, is, this, is, this is a demonstration of a complicated problem. But there's a lot of complicated problems on the planet that we are working on, including global warming and including... Uh, um, feeding the world's populations, uh, and, uh, you know, we just have to have smart people like you working on it, and we'll solve it. Take it one step at a time. So one step at a time, we start with gravity, and we have that kind of within body simulation methods that I talked about yesterday. Now we put in gas dynamics. We'll explore that a little bit today. We know that there's magnetic fields, but, but let's ignore them typically to begin with and just think about hydrodynamic methods. We have them. So let's, let's embed hydrodynamics inside end body models and bring a second fluid in to represent the baryons. Now, it requires a wide dynamic range, and in particular, baryons are going to end up being stirred up, and there's going to be turbulence generated. So we better have a wide dynamic range and be able to capture the cascade of turbulence uh, that, that, that can happen uh, in uh, nonlinear uh, regions like halos. Sometimes the core of halos will be cooler than the outer parts, or vice versa, and thermal conduction can happen to move heat from hot zones to cool zones. Now, if you have a magnetic field, 
uh, that, that, that's going to steer the electrons wherever the magnetic field wants to point them. So the tangled magnetic fields can shut off thermal conduction, and we don't know exactly how much thermal conduction there is on a galactic scale yet. That's kind of an open field uh, problem. But you can put it in, and you can parameterize it, and, uh, and try to figure it out as you go along. Interactions of baryons with the radiation field. As I mentioned, optically thin gas can radiate up and, and allow baryons to lose pressure support and cool. On the other hand, if you have a strong radiation source and you're a baryon nearby, you can heat up. So uh, you know, sometimes you cool, sometimes you heat. Now, uh, then you need to, if you have plasma that can cool, uh, maybe it will form a giant molecular cloud and actually start forming a group of stars star clusters or star pairs or whatever. So we need to think about how we can model that given realistic kind of resolution in a cosmological simulation of about you know, kiloparsec. I'll show you some simulations today that are really pushing to much higher resolution, something on the order of 10 parsecs rather than one kiloparsec. And that's very helpful, right? Because the size of molecular clouds is about parsec scale. And you're almost getting to the point where we can see individual star clusters happen in a cosmological setting, which is, which is awesome. At any rate, even in that environment, you need some rules for converting gas into stars. And if you're forming black holes, you need to seed them somehow and do all that stuff. We'll talk more about that, that tomorrow. Um, when, you can, when you form a star cluster, you need to understand what's the, fr what's the population of stars that form. What's their initial mass function? What's the frequency of uh, the number of stars as a function of stellar mass? Then you can go talk to the people who do stellar mass evolution and understand how the population, that population of stars will evolve over time. What will the optical colors expected from that population be if we observe this system? Uh, what are the supernova rates from this system? What are the yields of metals and uh, um, cosmic rays that come out of the supernova? There's lots of things that, that you would, in principle, need to put in from that. Okay, then, yeah, and that includes, so now we have uh, the, the fact that this initial mass function at the high mass end, you will have supernovae that go off. If you're forming black holes, compact systems, you can drive jets from accretion disks surrounding those black holes. How do we do that? Um, and then the metal production, turbulence, blah, blah, blah. And finally, if you're really going to small scales, um, cooling below about 10,000 degrees requires uh, molecules. And getting down to the scale in which, again, molecular clouds operate, you're talking about, say, typically hundreds of degrees or tens, even tens of degrees Kelvin. Cooling down to that scale requires molecular chemistry. And uh, that will affect radiative opacities and all this kind of stuff. So it, uh, there's a lot of different ingredients here. And, and, and different, again, different, some populations within the community will take different approaches to model either smaller scale systems or larger scale systems as needed. That's a long laundry list. I won't talk about everything here, but I just want to get it up there. And it's also important to remember that it's not quite complete, <laughs> necessarily. OK. So let's take a look at the equations we're trying to solve. Uh, this is from, again, um, I, I wish I could point you to a more recent review of, uh, of, of hydro sim simulation techniques in cosmology, but there really hasn't been one. Um, but Birchinger in 1998 kind of put together a review where he talked about this. Um, here are the basic equations from that paper. One has uh, Euler's uh, equation, equation of continuity. Um, and uh, then, again, so, so you're, you have to conserve mass. Uh, your acceleration involves both the Hubble term and gravity. But now we also have pressure gradients. And if we're going to think in an Eulerian sense, we had VEC material as well. right? So th those are our basic equations. And then we have to think about the energy or entropy of the gas. So U is an internal energy, S is an, an entropy. And basically, in terms of internal energy, there's going to be PDV work that looks like this. And then there's going to be both the possibility for heating and cooling to occur. So you can, and again, these are going to be either shocks or radiative for heating and radiative cooling for, uh, for, for loss, for losing internal energy. In terms of shock, uh, capturing shocks, you need to capture shocks to uh, uh, heat the gas in the first place. Uh, and at a planar shock, you have these conditions for conserving mass, momentum, internal energy. The rankine huygeno relations for a polytropic gas look like this. Um, in the limit of, of cold in fall, when, when the upstream material is, is relatively cold, one has a limit on the, the, the boost in density that occurs at, at, the, jump, at the jump in. Uh, the location of the shock, 
for it's gamma plus one over gamma minus one, which is equal to four for a monatomic gas. So, you, so you, you do go up in density. You can go up arbitrarily high in temperature, but the density uh, increase across the shock is going to be limited to about a factor of four. Now, there's various approaches numerically to handle that, and you know you can go to the Wikipedia page to understand these various techniques that have been in place. You know, is the, these techniques would have been in place, say, since, since the 50s, probably associated with uh, supersonic aircraft. Uh, modeling the behavior of, of the flight of supersonic aircraft, or um, modeling the behavior of a of Sputnik, you know, coming back in, into the Earth's atmosphere or something, right? Because you're going to generate shocks. You're moving supersonically at the top of the atmosphere. Um, so that's one, one way is to is to use schemes that finite difference schemes that try to capture this behavior. Uh, Analytic, essentially directly in your numerical method. Another way, if you don't take that, is, is to introduce an artificial viscosity, which just increases the pressure locally in regions where the flow is convergent. And so you just say, I'm going to raise the pressure in order to prevent uh, interpenetration of two streams of gas. And, and that will uh, both boost, uh, and that PDV work will heat the gas as well, as well as keeping it from keeping two streams of gas from, uh, uh, from overlapping and interpenetrating. This is the approach that's typically used in SPH, all those smooth, uh, which I'll talk about in a minute, uh, whereas these other approaches are more conventional to Eulerian techniques. Okay, I, just, I just said Eulerian, Lagrangian, what do I mean? Well, what I mean is the following. If you use the method of characteristics, as it's called, in fluid equations, and follow the streamlines of, of a flow, like imagine looking at a stream, you throw a leaf in it, the leaf will flow down the stream, right? So on the, the Lagrangian approach is to follow the leaf, become the leaf, and follow it. And then write whole derivatives of quantities as a, at the position of the leaf. Okay? As opposed to, I sit in the stream and I put a cell down and I watch the leaf go by. <laughs> right? That's this part, because it says the time rate of change of any quantity can involve both the production over here on the right-hand side of the equation, but also things can just leave my box because they're advecting through it. Okay. Uh, so th this takes care of the advection sort of naturally. It's a whole derivative versus a par versus partial derivative. So there's two extremes. The you Eulerian know, codes take this part, take this approach. Lagrangian uh, methods take this part. And there's something that's there's new techniques that are called kind of moving mesh. Um, that try to have the best of both worlds. And I'll, I'll say a little bit about uh, them in the next couple of slides. In fact, here's a very busy slide that uh, kind of summarizes some of the character of these different approaches, what their advantages are, disadvantages, gives some examples of codes out there that take this approach. Um, the first, historically, and I'll go into this a little bit because uh, yours truly was the guy who put this together. First approach was to use Lagrangian particle techniques. Right? Um, then came fixed Eulerian meshes. That is to say, take a cubic region, just put down a finite mesh of n cells on a side, and that's it. That's what you have, and solve your hydrodynamics in those cells. Right? Uh, the Eulerian adaptive mesh uses that approach, but it uses it in a hierarchical fashion. So you start with what's called a root grid of a given size, but within a root grid cell, you can now insert new grid cells at higher resolution and keep going hierarchically as you need. And then finally, these approaches use an, uh, various, they're relatively new, but they might use something like a, a Voronoi tessellation technique to define cells that advect with the flow. So you might use particles as tracers of the flow, and as the particles move around, you can define local volumes surrounding each particle and do, write your hydrodynamic equations in, the, uh, in those volumes. Okay, so it's... Uh, uh, there are various advantages. This is kind of fast and cheap. This is more expensive. Uh, these, I think, may be best of breed, but remain to be seen. The disadvantages here is that uh, for uh, Lagrangian particle techniques, the, the grid, as it were, is the, are the particles. They can deform arbitrarily, sort of. So you don't have, the, um, you can't easily do sort of analytic estimates for the error, i.e., you know, normally what you're thinking about in doing difference equations is I, I, I'm, I'm going to take a, a partial difference equation and approximate it with a difference equation that's of some order, i.e. I either use three cells or I use five cells or I use seven cells. That gives me some order. And then my error is the next order term that I'm missing. And then you can estimate that order later as you, when you do the calculation. It's harder to do that in SPH, harder to, to estimate that error analytically. So that's one of the 
one of the advantages is, is that you, of, of AMR is that you have that ability. These codes also seem to have that ability a little bit um, more than SPH. You also have to do uh, this shock capturing using uh, artificial viscosity in particle techniques, and that introduces kind of unwanted features that I'll show you some examples of in a, in a few slides. And there's various examples. Gadget, of course, is, is a workhorse. You'll we'll see a lot of gadget today. There's also an, a competing code uh, called gasoline out there. There's various AMR codes. Art, Enzo, we'll dive a little bit into Enzo today. Ramsey's is a, a European uh, version. Romain Tessier in, uh, in France uh, and Zurich has uh, built a nice code base uh, on AMR and Ramsey's. Uh, Flash is a more general purpose code that really grew out of more like, uh, you know, the bomb making people, if you will, uh, but also can be used for cosmological applications. And then new codes, Arepo and Gizmo, we'll see a little bit of Gizmo uh, today and, and tomorrow we'll see a little bit from Arepo. Okay, let me give you, uh, let me take you back in time to when I was approximately your age. I was a postdoc. I did my first postdoc, uh, very brief stint at Princeton University working with Jerry Ostreicher. Jerry wanted to do an AMR code. I thought that AMR was really complicated, and it is. So I decided, no, I'm going to do SPH. I left. I went to Cambridge, started working with George Ostathio and, and, and other people. So I'm working with George Ostathio. I took P3M, that code that I described yesterday, the particle, particle, particle mesh code, and I just embedded a second set of particles to rattle the baryons. And had them you know, follow the hydrodynamic equations that I just wrote down for you, okay? So that I did in 1988. And just to give you a sense of what 1988 was like, it was big hair, baggy jeans. Here's the next, who remembers next? The next computer, anybody ever operate on a next? <laughs> yeah. So yeah, so it, the the legacy is is such that you know, Steve Jobs went and formed Next, and during his hiatus, you know, his years in the desert, you know, he went off and uh, and, and formed Next, and there were a lot of great ideas uh, that eventually made their way into Apple OS X. I mean, one of them was a Unix operating system, which is OS X, right? And before that, Apple had its own operating system. I forget what it even it was called, you know, and it was, you know, it was just kind of like Windows, right? Lame. But now, you know, <laughs> OS X is, is a real operating system. Beetlejuice, everybody, how many have seen Be Beetlejuice? Yeah, okay, so there's, you know, you know. And, uh, and the Ford Taurus was like the new thing. Wow, you know, streamlined. Anyway, probably modeled with hydrodynamic, you know, <laughs> and I'm not kidding, right? That, that was, oh yeah, and it, so anyway, as I mentioned yesterday, you know, this whole cyber infrastructure thing, it's, uh, manufacturing has completely been transformed by, by CFD, by co computational uh, uh, CAD and, and, and CFD uh, approaches. I mean, you wouldn't think of, of putting together, people used to make clay models of everything, you know, in the auto industry. That still happens, but it only happens for like aesthetic purposes and, you know, that sort of, you, you can now, you know, with virtual reality, you can, you can drive your car around, you know, Chicago in virtual reality without, at what way less the cost than actually getting, building a, a prototype and taking it out to Chicago. Okay, um, here are the, from that paper, here are the equations. So this gives you a sense of what you do in, in these Lagrangian methods. You have a collection of particles, you need a density, because you got, you know, various things depend on density. What do you do? Well, you just use a local kernel density estimate. So uh, every gas particle has that mass mg. This is like a Gaussian function. You just sum up a set of Gaussians, like surrounding each particle. They weight every particle with a Gaussian. So there's a finite kernel uh, with various properties, good properties. And then in order to achieve high resolution, this, this is the scale of a Gaussian. Let's let that scale vary depending on conditions. And so over time, as you step forward and the density start to increase, I'm going to vary H in a way that sort of captures, uh, allows me to achieve higher density. So a, an increase in density will decrease H and allow me to resolve finer and finer features as the calculation goes on. Obviously, I have to stop at some point. I can't allow myself to go to H equals zero. But again, we have a gravitational softening scale, which kind of sets the minimum scale of the calculation. So that's fine. We stop around there. Then we need a pressure gradient, right? We need a pressure gradient term. It helps to take that pressure gradient term, write it this way, and use you know, this trick, integrate by parts, so that you transform the gradient in your thing into an integral of the thing with the gradient of the kernel. Cool. So basically, the pressure gradient forces look like, let me take P over rho squared, symmetrize it, and then 
uh, take, weight each, each of my particle pairs locally with the gradient of, of my kernel. And the symmetry is important here because basically symmetrizing the pair interactions will conserve global momentum, and you do want to do that. Uh, then there's an energy equation, but once you have, you know, uh, PD, the PDV work is handled this way, so here we see we've got kind of a del with a, a, a gradient dotted with a, a local velocity field. So I can tell whether the flow is, the flow is expanding, I'm going to drop in thermal energy. If the flow is converging, I'm going to raise my thermal energy. Okay. Uh, some simple tests, and I have to say that, uh, uh, you know, you're young, right? As you go on in your career, there's always this kind of ideal that, that you want to have something named after you, right? You want to have a particle. I mean, if you have a particle, it's like, ah, oh, that's, that's the coolest, right? Uh, I have a test. <laughs> Uh, this is kind of part of what's called the Everard test. It's, it's a collapse of a, an initially R equals minus one density profile, st static, you know, the static initial conditions, let's just let it collapse on itself. Uh, this is just part of the test that I did in 1988. And here I'm showing you the gas distrib distribution of gas particles at some time in the calculation. Later it's evolved, it started to collapse. You can see that it started to collapse because um, here are the dark matter particles. They've already, the ones that started life on the left-hand side have already streamed through the core and are come out the right side and vice versa. You can also see the initial grid setup. It was set up with a grid and therefore you've got this collection of, you know, coherence in here that is artificial, uh, but, but still, uh, you know, that it is what it is back in the day. And, um, but the gas, you'll see, I mean, you, these guys are streaming through, very high velocity. These guys are not. These guys have stopped interpenetrating as they should with some small errors here and here. Uh, but that's what the artificial viscosity is doing, is preventing the gas from free streaming through the, through the center of your spherical perturbation, whereas the dark matter happily does. Let me just jump forward to 1994 rather than 1988 to show you some science calculations that came out. Um, and uh, here is a paper that I wrote with Frank Summers and Mark Davis while a postdoc at Berkeley using uh, a Cray YMP supercomputer at San Diego Supercomputing Center back in the day. Um, and it's a 2 by 64 cube particle ensemble modeling a 16 megaparsec region. We evolved to a redshift of 1. Um, the particle mass here is about 10 to the 8, which is kind of not uh, crazy. It's not until recently that the, that particle mass for the gas has been uh, pushed to much lower values. Um, and the softening was about 10 kiloparsecs. And here is a, 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 I'm showing you the full volume, 16 megaparsecs. We're going to zoom in later on this. At redshift of 3, you see the filaments. Here's the dark matter. Here's the baryons. On large scales, they trace each other. On small scales, here's the dark matter in halos uh, only. And then here's the, the baryons in what are called gal what we called galaxy-like objects, the really high-density cold stuff. We allowed radiative cooling to happen in this calculation, and the baryons sank down to the bottom. And at redshift of one, sorry, at redshift of three, zooming in on that inner box, here we see again the galaxies are much more compact compared to the dark matter halos. And then going out to going forward to redshift of one, the end of the calculation, we essentially have a group scale halo here with multiple galaxies in it, another smaller group over here with multiple galaxies in it. And then, oops, you uh, can actually, this was the first paper to actually try to uh, measure what's called the halo occupation distribution, the number, average number of galaxies in a halo of mass m. Um, you can see here's the baryonic mass of these galaxy-like objects as a function of halo mass. Most, at the low mass, you have one galaxy per halo, and then at about a few 10 to the 12th, you can start breaking out into multiple uh, galaxies per halo. And here's that number as a function of halo mass. And lastly, this is the end of history now, the end of the ancient history. Uh, what was surprising was we didn't anticipate this. Uh, this. This was came up in post-processing while I was visualizing the results of the simulation. I noticed that there were these thin disks occasionally. And, and so we actually, here's a, you know, a larger structure, but here's a little galaxy here. We blow it up and blow it up again. It, here's the velocity field. You know, you formed a disk. So it was the first simulation that naturally formed uh, a disk galaxy in a cosmological environment. All right, let's move forward to more or less the present day. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about more modern recipes for cooling and star formation. Now, um, as I said, only un very recently have we been able to perform calculations in a cosmological setting which have resolutions that really can push down to where the giant molecular clouds are forming stars. Um, 
most of the time you're, you're, you're dealing with re spatial resolutions that are larger than this, and sometimes much larger than this. So you have to have some kind of what are called subgrid recipes or rules for deciding how you convert plasma into stars, and then what happens when the stars evolve and push back. So there, these m rules are heuristic. You know, there's no exact you know, solutions for anything. Uh, they're, they're, they're mainly motivated by being quote, quote unquote physically reasonable. Um, and they're empirically tuned, meaning you have some free parameters and then you try to sort of match something in the observations to, to uh, tune your parameters. So for example, in gasoline, a paper by uh, Stinson et al. 2006, here are the rules for forming stars. Gas must be colder than 15,000 Kelvin, must be denser than 0.1 particles per cc, must be over density enough to be part of a virial structure that's almost guaranteed when you apply this density condition. And it must be part of a converging flow, which again is almost guaranteed when you apply this density condition. So, yeah, okay, so those are the rules. So you write down these rules, you parameterize them, you put them in. Um, so it, there's multiple parameters, but these very high resolution zoom simulations that I'll talk about in a minute can avoid some of these parameterizations. Uh, so then when you form a star, you have to form a star particle. That star particle, again, might have masses, say, 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7 solar masses. So it represents a whole collection of stars, the same way that a dark matter particle represents a whole kind of part of the phase space of dark matter. Um, and then you can tag it with things like its formation time, the local gas metallicity. And then later, you can group these stars to particles together to, to say what's in one galaxy versus what's in another. Now, um, one of the challenges here has always been, well, how do we set these parameters? And as I mentioned, you know, you're often tuning to low redshift empirical data. Here's an example. If this star, there, there's a parameter here called C star, which is the efficiency of, of how, what fraction of my gas in, in, this, uh, in this region should I convert into stars. If you set it too low, what happens is you don't quite match the observed, the observed, sorry, let me take a step back. Kennecut in 1998, Rob Kennecut, uh, looked out at, at local observations of galaxies and, and sort of wrote down what's called Kennecut Law. It's like a Schmidt Law for galaxy formation that the star formation rate in a, in a spiral disk will scale as, a, as some power of the mass surface density, the gas mass surface density in that disk. So it's just a power law relation between how much mass I have per unit area in my disk and how much stars form per unit area in my disk. So that's given by this line here because this is star formation rate in units of solar masses per square kiloparsec per year versus gas surface density in units of solar masses per, per parsec squared. Okay, and, and what I'm aiming for is this line and what the simulations produced with C star goal 0.1 was this. So now they go back. Okay, let me, let me just go ramp that up by a factor of five and voila, at least at the high surface density end, I'm doing pretty well. Here's the difference in star formation rate is appreciable, right? For this lower setting, um, you know, here's my star formation rate as a function of time. Now for my higher setting, it's actually high and then starts to drift down a little lower. Um, furthermore, not only do you have these kinds of parameter dependencies, but there's also just resolution issues. So here's from that paper, Stinson et al., uh, showing what happens when the gas disk is modeled with 11,000, 55,000, 275,000 particles. Star formation rate is kind of high at low resolution lowers a little bit at higher resolution and then kind of gets episodic. Completely changes character at very high resolution. And it was because of that, uh, was, they, they claim, it was because of the one condition wasn't being satisfied at very high resolution. Basically the condition of, uh, there was a genes condition associated with um, the gas being able to pressure support itself or not. And in the case of very high resolution, some of these local patches were able to pressure support themselves and weren't satisfying the genes condition. So basically, they, the, their, their solution, shut off the genes condition. <laughs> what they did. Yes? The stars become a collisionless species, and they follow end body. Yes, so some of the stars. Yes. Yes. Yes, so, so okay, the, the question is uh, the, that s the stars will form a collision. You, when you form a star particle, it becomes a collisionless species and it st just evolves in an end body matter, uh, in manner due to gravity. But there's a clock happening that records how long since that packet of stars was formed. And at some point after, you know, uh, 
10, uh, 100 million years or 10 million years, there will be supernova going off. Type 2 supernova first, later type 1 supernova later, and that will affect the local gas. That is actually taken care of in the sense that there are source terms written out in the, in the equations that look for star particles and say, are you ready to go supernova? And if you are, then feedback. And the exact details vary depending on code. And, you know, the, they'll, uh, that's all part of, you know, it's IMF dependent, metallicity dependent, potentially, all, all sorts of stuff. Yeah. Um, okay, so uh, as I mentioned, the very high resolution studies, some of which I'll show movies of in a few minutes. Um, well, okay, that, your question was well posed because uh, this, the, we, we just talked about this. Under an assumed IMF, you could then take your stellar populations and you write source terms that give back uh, both momentum, energy, and mass into the surrounding gas. Uh, and very high resolutions, you know, not only do you, go, do you have supernova feedback, but basically massive stars on small scales. I mean, those beautiful pictures of like the Horsehead Nebula or, you know, other um, beautiful HST images uh, come about because of radiation pressure or involved radiation pressure onto dust in giant molecular cloud complexes and stuff. So you can move gas around just through radiation pressure of stellar populations. So, but you need very high resolution to be able to kind of see that effect. And uh, that's just happened re relatively recently. I'll show you work by uh, Andrew Wetzel and the fire team uh, in a couple of slides. So, you know, and, and their, their, their claim here, which I boxed, is maybe a little bit excessive in the sense that, you know, in italics, this is their italics, no tuning of parameters. Well, what's happened is the subgrid approach with parameters has been replaced with let's apply somebody else's code that does all of this for us, right? So what you're doing is you're talking to Klaus Leiderer, who, you know, and his and company who built this code Starburst 99, and that Starburst 99 tells you about how, uh, what are the effects of a star, what, what do you get back in terms of photon fields, radiation fields from uh, a, uh, uh, a population of stars of a certain age and a certain IMF. And you can just embed that into your calculation. And yeah, there are no free parameters, but you know, go back to Klaus and ask, well, okay, this is version 7.0. What will version 11.0 look like in six years? <laughs> you know, what else, what, what's wrong with version 7.0? What do we need to do to improve it? And you're never done. Uh, but I'm not saying this is bad. I'm saying that, that this, is, this is kind of where the field is moving. It's moving into more coupled, coupled approaches of taking astrophysical components and embedding them literally into the calculation rather than writing a subgrid parameterization of it that just involves a couple of numbers that you tune. Okay, taking a step back, let's think about a Milky Way cal calculation. For a long time, uh, there, was, there were difficulties forming uh, a galaxy that looked like the Milky Way in the sense of having a relatively small bulge and an extended thin disk. Uh, what was often happening was you'd get a big fat bulge and a small disk. Most, so you were, there was an angular momentum problem. Basically, you were losing too much angular momentum in, in, in the gas. Well, the claim was uh, that was made in this paper by Guedes et al., here's another named simulation, the ARES simulation, was that um, what you need to do is to concentrate the effects of star formation and feedback into higher density regions. So what they did was take that 0.1 per cubic centimeter density threshold and ramp it up by a factor of 50. So that instead of like having a popcorn popper of stars going off all over in your disk, you'd really have only the densest regions forming stars. And those dense regions would particularly be confined in the center, which then drove the gas out to higher radius, which re reduced the amount of slow angular momentum gas you had and, and conserved more of the angular momentum in the system overall as a function of time, allowing you to let the gas drizzle back onto the disk later and form a big fat disk. So uh, seeing is believing, quote unquote, right? Uh, here's their disk galaxy. Uh, here it is viewed edge on. Here it is viewed face on. And then this is a th synthetic optical image uh, in, uh, let's see, so this is uh, blah, blah, blah. Okay, IV and far UV uh, composite color, RGB color. Uh, it's showing you the old stars will be, will, will be red, new stars will be blue, e et cetera. So, you know, it is a thin disk. And in fact, it's almost got no bulge to it at all. It's really, you know, so this, this, this paper said, okay, this is important going to very high resolution and confining star formation to the very uh, uh, high, high density regions. Uh, 
what they see is they see there is a little bit of a bulge. So here's showing you surface brightness as a function of radius for that system at the end of the calculation. There is a little baby bulge in the core, which is hard to see in that image that I showed you previously, followed by an exponential disk with a scale length of about two and a half kiloparsecs. So it's kind of a baby Milky Way. Um, or you know, Milky Way scale disk scale length is about two and a half, uh, a little bit, maybe a little larger than, than two and a half kiloparsecs. Um, and uh, so their dark matter looks like NFW, and then they get a hot gas component, which uh, we now know exists in, in spiral galaxies and emits uh, weekly in X-rays. Now, this is the last slide that I'll show from this uh, paper, but one interesting question uh, that people have talked about, in, uh, and I won't talk a lot about it, although I'll mention a little bit more tomorrow on it, is the question of missing baryons. Where are all the baryons in the universe? When you do a counting of baryons in stars in the universe, you only get about 10% of the global baryon fraction. We know the global baryon fraction well from cosmic nucleosynthesis, which I'm sure you heard about from Professor Ryden. Um, and uh, when you do some accounting to try to figure out, well, where are those baryons, they're not all in stars. Uh, and then when you, so then you can look for gaseous phases and you realize, well, we're not getting it all in the gas. But there's this kind of, there's a lot of volume out there. Galaxies occupy about one millionth of the volume, the bright parts of galaxies occupy less than one millionth of the volume of the universe. So you've got all of this space out there that you can just fill with very dilute gas at, say, a temperature of about a little under 10 to the fifth Kelvin. And there's almost, there's very few ways to detect that, either through absorption or emission lines, especially if it's very tenuous. So, there, so that's probably where all the baryons are. Uh, but uh, what you can see in their calculations is that the baryon fraction in their galaxy is large when they use this canonical, you know, sort of lower density threshold. But when they go to the higher density threshold, there's more action to drive baryons out of the proto halos and, and the final halo. So they get a reduced fraction, a baryon fraction within uh, the halo at a redshift of zero. Okay, now I'm going to move to show you some movies from this. Uh, I think in, in the last couple of years, probably what, what I've noticed happening quite a bit is, uh, is more of kind of a a Sony motion pictures approach to simulations. <laughs> like, we've done a simulation, watch this movie. It's great. Uh, which is fine, I mean, it's capturing the imagination and, it's for, and, and again, there's a lot of insight to be had from watching movies. That's why I'm gonna show you some movies, okay. But, uh, but it's important to, you know, so th this FIRE project led by uh, uh, Phil Hopkins, now at Caltech, hosted at Northwestern University, has some really interesting stuff and I, I recommend that you go and, and, and take a look at it. Um, uh, the technology has let me down. Keynote decided not to embed movies yesterday, just decided not to play them. I don't, I haven't solved that, so what I'm gonna have to do is get out. And then we're gonna go over here. Where is my, where are you? Okay, here I am. And we are going to play, uh, I wanna play this one first. Here is a 50 megaparsec region. We're going to see the gas temperature. Play for me. Play for me. Okay, I have to escape back out. Start playing first. Out. Um, and what we're seeing here is inside this 50 megaparsec physical region, low, low temperature gas is kind of white, it's actually magenta. Uh, and then green is an intermediate uh, gas of, of maybe 10 to the 4 to 10 to the 5K, and red is greater than 10, 10 to the 5K. And what you can see is the action of this feedback of supernova happening episodically. Uh, and, uh, and this is extremely high resolution uh, simulation, so there's not, the subgrid prescriptions have been replaced by this lighter or 1999 kind of uh, starburst prescriptions for uh, both stellar and supernova uh, feedback. And I'll just let the clock run. We're seeing redshift change up, up there. Redshift of one, as I mentioned yesterday, for a galaxy like the Milky Way, which is, this is a simulation of something that's roughly Milky Way size. At the end, by the way, we'll be seeing this galaxy face on. Um, so, wow, there was just a local episode that drove out a lot of gas. There's also dust uh, in this calculation. So each uh, cell contains information about a lot of 
gas properties, including chemistry and including uh, information about a dust population. And uh, we see some later accretion of material coming in, which disturbs the disk, but nothing major in terms of uh, mergers happens, although we'll see at the very end there's kind of an interesting system that, that floats in from the right-hand side. Uh, now we can see, you know, this looks pretty disky. Uh, it's it's uh, self-gravitating uh, uh, in a relatively static potential. There's a little interaction with a accreting satellite there at low redshift. I have a couple more movies that I will show. So remember, this is just the gas phase. We're not seeing the dark matter. The dark matter would fill out to the edges of the room here, a uh, dark matter halo. We're just looking at the very inner part of the galaxy. Let us now take a look at the behavior. A hard time seeing where my... Now we're going to watch the stars in the same system. Time. And of course, there are no stars early on, and then stars start to form. And the stars, uh, you, you, what you're seeing are synthetic images that will include the, in, the uh, screening of dust when uh, occasionally you'll see dust lanes pop up here, like there. Uh, so the dark regions that, that, that occur are uh, because our line of sight to this galaxy will be shrouded by um, intervening dust, gas and dust. And we'll see again that there's a lot of merging early on, which then settles down. Uh, the, the, the disk, it's not as if you form a disk galaxy that the, the angular momentum vector is not just constant in time, right? It does dance around due to interactions and, and mergers. But after about a redshift of one, the angular momentum vector is pretty well established. It's coming essentially out of the page at us. Uh, again, you can see that dust, the, uh, that big interaction that happened or that big uh, star formation event that drove a lot of gas out of the core at around a redshift of 0.9 or so also had the effect of driving a lot of dust out of the core. And you saw that in the dust lanes. Point mushing out. Yes? Uh, the simulation size is, uh, it's one of these zoom simulations. So the whole size of the simulation, if I remember correctly, is something on the order of 100 megaparsecs or ten, many tens of megaparsecs. But the uh, region that we're looking at is just a, more like a few megaparsecs on a side. The high resolution region is, is just enough to, to resolve the formation of the galaxy itself. Now, and, and of course, that, that interaction it's a tidal interaction that pulls off some stars, and, and that's the kind of interaction that creates uh, stellar streams in the Milky Way halo that the Sloan Digital Sky Survey has observed and will be observed further by Dark Energy Survey. Okay, one last movie, which will go back to the gas, but now we're, what we're going to do is zoom out to a larger scale. And what's nice about this part of the uh, movie is actually these are physical, you're, you're looking at a movie of, with a fixed physical size of 200 kiloparsecs on a size now. Uh, and so that the high, re you can see this is the high resolution zone at redshift of 30. Uh, you're seeing it in its entirety now. When I turn the movie on, you see the Hubble expansion initially. So that's what's going on physically. And here, it gives you a little bit more sense of the filamentary network that, again, is, is kind of corresponding to the movie that I showed yesterday from Aquarius simulation, where at high redshift you see this filamentary cosmic web that then condenses uh, to form the final system at the end. Here again, you're seeing that condensation. And that whole 200 kiloparsec region by a redshift of two is already filled pretty much with hot gas. Right? Now here's an accretion event. We'll see the effect of that starburst in the center coming up very soon. Oh, there we go. And we see that that, that that starburst event doesn't drive out. It does drive material to large radius, maybe say of order 100 kpc, but it doesn't unbind that gas. On a smaller galaxy, an event like that could completely unbind the gas, and that will take us back at the very end of the, today's lecture to this missing satellites problem 
little satellite galaxy down below, which itself is having its own convulsions. And this later gets, so now we see how it gets accreted. And then feeds back tidal streams. And ultimately, if we continued to move the clock forward, it would completely merge with the parent galaxy. And you see it's on its way. Okay. Yes, question. Uh, can simulations make bars, make barred galaxies? The answer is yes. Um, and and I, those, uh, those simulations are kind of old in the sense that uh, people have been doing isolated galaxy simulations to model, uh, in particular, the, the spiral structure and, and, and um, nonlinear interactions that, that happen in, in disk galaxies probably for 20, 30 years. But it's only recently that they've emerged in a cosmological setting like these kinds of calculations. Any other questions? Okay, let's go back to uh, keynote. The movies that were supposed to play that didn't. And finally, here's a picture of um, that simulation I just showed you. These are just now I images looking face on and edge on, both with dust in the upper panel. And then if you ignored dust, this is what you would see in the lower panel. You can see the obscuring effects of dust. And it's a beautiful picture, right? In the sense that I showed you the, on like slide one, that I said we want to make these guys. Well, we're kind of at this level of resolution. They've done, we've done it, right? I mean, we're kind of done. It's pretty cool. Uh, but we don't have all the morphologies there. Right? This, 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 so one thing to remember is this is kind of a, this is a 10 million hour or you know, few million hour calculation on a, on a major supercomputer. Those, thing, those kinds of simulations don't come cheap. We're talking about something on the order of $10,000 in power and cooling alone to just do that simulation. Right? So creating millions of these galaxies is going to be a challenge in simulations. All right, let us take a look at ENZO. Um, we're at the one hour mark. I'm going to try to keep the time today because I know lunch is happening and I want to have lunch with you guys. Let's, but let's, let, me, let me take you inside the, the belly of the beast, as it were. Um, ENZO is interesting in that it is the one truly open source code out there in computational cosmology. There are codes available, gadgets available, but it's, kind of not, kind of, it's not been kind of officially open sourced. This is hosted, uh, I think, on GitHub. I can't remember which repository, but it's hosted in a repository where you can fork, you can you can pull it down, fork it, create a new track, and feed back to the community. And it's a real, you know, honest to god, uh, computer science development, you know, developed uh, uh, open source uh, code base. And associated with that open sourcing of the code was a paper from 2014 or 15, uh, shown here. All the collaborators uh, involved in Enzo. Uh, are, are listed as authors on, on, on this paper. Um, it is a long paper, a lot of detail. If you really want to know, go there. We'll, we'll walk through a little bit of this. Uh, in section two of this paper, section 2.2 in particular, kind of lists these 12 different uh, kind of components that uh, are involved in ENZO. And let's just kind of read through them. Well, you've got to deal with your mesh, so you have to do adaptive mesh refinement. That's kind of shown graphically here in two dimensions. If you have a root grid of four by four, then you want to adapt locally as the calculation evolves to refine that uh, single cell into multiple subcells and do that refinement hierarchically. That's shown in the red down there. Um, then you're going to solve the hydrodynamics equations in an Eulerian way. Uh, so you have to have some kind of solver to do that. There are multiple different solver techniques available within Enzo. Um, and we'll show, I'll show a little bit of detail on that later. You have to have gravity, obviously, along with pushing a collisionless component of particles that represent the dark matter. Um, then, as I mentioned, you have cooling and chemistry. Uh, that you also have the ability to turn on a homogeneous radiation background. 
because if you're doing a cosmological simulation, uh, we still are not entirely sure how reionization occurs at redshifts of order eight or 10. Uh, but it's probably from a, you know, you'd like to have a calculation that resolves the sources of ionizing radiation. But until you, you know, if you're not, if you don't have that resolution, you can instead just impose a, an ionizing radiation field um, of your own design that's uh, available. Um, and then you can do radiative transport in two different approaches. You can also do heat conduction, star formation feedback. And then there's a whole section to talk about how time stepping is done. All right, and then this is a, an, a distributed parallel, a parallel code that uses message passing interface prescriptions to, uh, to handle communication among processors. On a processor, you might handle uh, grid zones that are shown in black, but in order to do your finite difference calculations, you need the surrounding region as well, right? Because in order to do a pressure gradient here, you need to finite difference both from this side and that side. So you import from other processors what are called ghost zones in order to do that calculation. And so that's uh, the, the, you have to handle all of that communication and uh, uh, in real time as calculation evolves. As you go forward in time, there's a, the root grid sets a global time step, but then as you go down the hierarchy, you typically uh, have shorter and shorter time steps associated with the higher resolution zones. These, this, what's shown here are factors of two, but the factors of two are not a, uh, a constraint in, uh, in ENSO, but uh, for, for graphical purposes, we can just think of that. So, uh, first you solve uh, at the root level, then you go down, solve the next level, do two steps at the lowest level, come back up to do that intermediate level, go back down, do two more, and then come back up to the root, right? That's kind of the order of which you would go. Here is a partial list from table one of the parameters involved <laughs> inside the code. So if you could pull down the code, there's gonna be some, you know, read me, and also some includes, if you will, that will define structures in the code and, and, and parameters, here they are. You can't read them, that's kind of purposeful because I just want to highlight this little section up there, uh, star formation and feedback, to remind you about the things that we've already talked about, this kind of a minimum particle mass, a genes mass in a cell, um, the star formation uh, efficiency parameter, a metallicity fraction, blah, 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 right? All sorts of stuff uh, that you now have control of. Okay, and you as the user, you as the, as the simulator need to make choices. Cooling function, like this, and when you turn on a rain, an ionizing radiation field, the cooling function actually becomes a heating function at low temperatures. So what's shown here is a cooling function of different styles. Again, you, have, you can flip switches to go between using, say, cloudy versus Sarazin and white, 1987, which are shown in blue and, and red. Uh, respectively, they're you know close, but not identical. Um, and then below about uh, a few ten of the four K, when you have an ionizing background, these little dips change represent a change in sign. This is logarithmic. So below this, you actually are heating the gas. Above this, you're cooling the gas. That temperature. Finally, this is the last slide from Enzo. Here's a unit test. Well, Enzo comes with a package as if you were to pull it down and develop it. In order to make sure that you haven't screwed up the code, there's a number of unit tests that you can perform on the code. One of them is very simple and is shown here. It's a unit, it's a propagation of a single sound wave. So you put a low amplitude pressure density perturbation into, um, let's say, the left-hand side of the box and let it propagate with velocity taking it to the right. The gray region shows you one level of refinement Initially, there were 100 grid cells on a unit position zero to one, so we're just looking at a small region here. Um, but the, go, you go from the root level description to a one zone higher as you cross from here to here. And those, so this test is trying to ask the question, can we propagate a sine wave without introducing any funny features as it goes through the refined region and pops out the other side? Okay, so the refined region is confined to 0.25 to 0.75, and this shows you the beginning and end of the propagation using three different methods for propagating the wave, three different hydrodynamic solvers, PPM, piecewise parabolic, the original Zeus method, and this muscle scheme that, again, I, I, I had on the previous graph. And this is kind of a challenge. I mean, so you look at this and you go, geez, that doesn't look so great. I mean, Zeus does probably the best job. The blue is what you expect. The blue is the analytic, you know, propagating a sine wave is an analytic thing, sine, you know, kx minus omega t. And, but the problem is that what, what's done here is to push the wavelength to be very short, 
10 cells on a, on a wavelength, which means a half a wavelength is just five cells. So that's pretty challenging numerically, right? You only have five resolution elements in a half wavelength. And so Zeus does a pretty good job, except that it has these oscillations, right, that, that, that it introduces as you, as you propagate. So although it preserves the amplitude, it's not very diffusive, but it also is not all that stable in the sense that it introduces more features than you originally had. On the other hand, PPM and muscle are, don't introduce oscillations, right? They're, 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 not, uh, they're more stable, but they're more diffusive. They lose amplitude, right? So these are the kind of choices that one has to, but again, remember, this is a, this is a barely resolved feature. So you know, it's not as if, if, we, if we had just used 100 zones per wavelength instead of 10, these solutions would look much, much better. Okay. Uh, so it's one of several unit tests that you can do with this code. And again, this is kind of the future. It's a stable code base that we can build on as we go forward as a community. All right, I want to spend some time on code comparisons, and then we'll finish out uh, going back to that, uh, two, that small scale Lambda CDM problem with a couple of slides. Okay, so, uh, you know, like I said, uh, it's hard to, to you, you can build code that conserves, conserves quantities, but beyond that, it's a little hard to tell when you're doing things right. So one of the things you can do, though, is to at least do verification. We can take code A and code B, put in the same initial conditions, put in the same physics, and ask, do we get the same answer? That's what's being done in these code comparisons. It's kind of cross-verification. So here is an early version of this done in 1999. Um, you can see my code, P3MSPH, up here. Uh, but this is the early version of Enzo from Greg Bryan. Just a few levels of refinement were used in this calculation. There were other grid codes here and here that were kind of coarser resolution. Otherwise, the rest are SPH, except for these two are moving early moving mesh uh, codes that actually never survived. They were, they were interesting in their day, uh, weren't quite as, as, as powerful and as ready as Arepo and, and Gizmo are now. Anyway, th this is the dark matter. So you see similar structure. Uh, one thing you, you'll notice is that there are substructures which are not always in the same place. Here, for example, is a substructure that in this solution is over here. It's crossed over to the other side. That's just because we're working in a highly nonlinear environment. If you make small errors in the initial state, they can get amplified the way that chaotic systems do. Uh, so the, the, a small initial change in the linear phase, of, the quasi linear phase of the evolution can lead to a kind of difference between this subhalo being over here versus over here at the end of the day. Don't worry about those features so much. We're going to look at statistically averaged properties in a minute. That's the dark matter. Here's the gas. First thing you notice is the gas is rounder. That's good because uh, the gas is, uh, has an isotropic pressure tensor, whereas the dark matter is supporting itself by an anisotropic velocity distribution. So, yeah, it should be rounder, but you also see that there's different levels of core density. Some of them are very high, some of them are very low. This is a very low resolution calculation, so it didn't achieve the high density shown in red and white on this diagram. Also, some of these calculations are noisier. Here's a very noisy calculation from Owen. And then finally, the temperature map. Uh, similar kinds of temperatures. Uh, again, uh, the hot gas sort of fills the inner sort of megaparsec. Uh, temperatures vary somewhat, but I'll show you a temperature. Uh, no, I won't show you. I'm going to show you instead a density and entropy profile. The entropy profile is uh, a sort of pseudo entropy where one takes the temperature and divides by rho to the gamma minus one. And that in the log is the uh, entropy that's plotted on the right-hand side. So um, what's shown here, and it's a little hard to see, is uh, multiple different solutions. The code name's over here. And here is the gas density profile. And here's the gas entropy profile. One thing you'll notice that we'll see again in, in, in the next slide, which is a very recent code comparison paper, is that the AMR codes, the grid codes, have this kind of constant entropy core, whereas the SPH solutions continue down in entropy sort of all the way uh, in. Notice the, the sort of virial radius, or R200 for this system, will be about, is about two megaparsecs. So we're going down about one-tenth of R200 in this calculation, uh, in these calculations. We're going to move forward now from 1999 to 2016, when a similar exercise was done, um, called the NIFTY cluster comparison. 2016, some millennial. Here's again some you know, pictures of the calculation at the end. 
Here is the gas density now as a function of radius. R200 is shown by this dotted line, and so we're pushing much further in, in with bigger computers, higher resolution, we can, we can resolve the core structure. And what you see is, uh, is th these small deviations that were visible in 1999 just get amplified as you go to, to smaller and smaller scales. Um, and in particular, the grid codes, Ramsey's um, and uh, ART, which are the black lines, have kind of a limited central density. Uh, almost, almost a constant, like core density, if you will. Whereas some of the SPH codes continue to rise in, 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 in density as you go to the core, and that corresponds to also a decline in entropy. It turns out that that is uh, that these solutions are very likely wrong. So we've discovered something in this code comparison that the right answers are probably here, and the reason why you can see that is because some of sorry, let me back up for a second. Some of these blue lines are gadget with a new SPH method that's designed to uh, better handle uh, gas mixing in subsonic turbulent environments. Here are some of the test cases with which people developed some of these new SPH methods. A paper by Beck et al. just recently, last year. Um, this is a time evolution where time goes down. This is a periodic region where you just have a cold blob in pressure equilibrium with surrounding gas that's not shown. It's the black. So the cold blob is propagating here. It's periodic, so it pops back. Uh, so it, 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 uh, it pops back into the field. Um, and under the old scheme, what, what happened is that uh, the blob would get deformed, but most of the material wouldn't mix with the surrounding low-density medium. It would kind of be preserved and, and, and shielded because of the way that the pressure, various technical reasons that you can read the paper to understand if you really care. The new versions allow this, this blob to be shredded. Now, the important thing to realize here is that this is pure hydrodynamics. There's no gravity. This is not a cosmological experiment. This is an experiment that you can do in a lab. <laughs> so, you know, that's why it's important is because you can validate the, the code this way. Now, remember, verification is, there's verification and validation in the world of computer science. Verification is kind of, well, I have ways in which I think that I can develop, I can make arguments for consistency and correctness of my solution. Validation is harder. Validation is, I can do an experiment that tells me the right answer, and I can check my code and see if it got the right answer, right? So, uh, for example, I can light a cigarette uh, or a joint, and let the smoke, <laughs> and let the smoke rise up. And what we'll, what you'll see is as the smoke rises up, it will develop, you know, Rayleigh-Taylor instabilities. There it will, it will form curls. Right? You've seen that. Uh, I don't need to demonstrate it. Not at this time of the morning. And uh, and and so what? This is what you expect. And 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 you can do these kinds of calculations where you have um, a, a, a rarefied medium in pressure equilibrium. So it's, uh, it's a little higher uh, temperature, or lower density, moving relative to a substrate, and there's an interface. There's a contact discontinuity, right? At that contact dis discontinuity, it's unstable. And it's unstable to these uh, Kelvin Helmholtz rolls. And again, this is stuff that you can do in a lab. And so nature tells you what the solution is. You don't make it up. And so the old scheme used to not develop, and used to not mix. The new schemes do. This mixing is important. This is the kind of thing that happens when a sub uh, halo falls in. Its edges are going to get shredded like this. So you need to be able to do this. So the new SPH methods do it well, and they do it as well as the, as the grid codes do. OK. Uh, and, the, and then let me just show you the other uh, graphs from this paper, which show you, again, that, that the new versions of Gadget produce an entropy core the same way that the AMR codes do. So basically, these codes need to be retired. These codes need to be promoted, and that's we've we've learned something. It's taken twenty some odd years, but we've learned something. All right, now uh, another code comparison, relatively recent, Scanapeco at all, twenty twelve, uh, is a little more depressing, um, in the sense that this was just a everybody show up. Here's some initial conditions. Put your full physics quote unquote in and form a galaxy. And here are the answers, and you can see kind of from your distance, you know, they look kind of similar. But look at the size of this disk compared to the size of this disk, right? That's pretty order unity difference, right? Uh, 
Uh, I'm going to show you more detail that will get you even more depressed. Um, here's different codes. The, the, what's shown here is the circular velocity curve of the galaxy, so they do form a disk at the end, and then you're looking at the circular velocity of the gas and stars as a function of radius from the center of the galaxy. The Milky Way is shown as gray, so you're kind of shooting for that. Most of these codes have very high density interiors, which lead to high circular velocities, uh, and that's true for a, large, a lot of them. Some of them don't. So some of them do better than others, quote unquote. Um, what I'm going to show you next is, is some global properties. And the global property being shown over here is stellar mass versus halo mass as a function of time. The time is shown by just a line. And then the final redshift zero behavior is shown by the, by the symbol. And you know, sadly, what you see is that there's a, a dynamic range here uh, of almost an order of magnitude in the final stellar mass of the, of the galaxy disk, galactic disk. Uh, there's actually a dynamic range of you know 50 percent in just the mass of the halo, uh, so a lot of a lot of deviation. Here is the circular velocity as a function of stellar mass for all of these uh, different uh, simulations. Observations are the little points down here, and somehow or other, uh, the, the conspiracy is such that the simulations lie on either side of the of the observations. None of them quite. Uh, match what's going on in, in observations. So it's a challenge. This is, this, this is a challenge, but I should say that these, uh, these codes were, were all run kind of before the fire simulations that I showed you. So uh, you know, I think we're, we're, on a, we're on a good path to do a much better job of this in, in the next few years. All right, so here's a little su pre-summary, and then I'll just have a few slides to, to go back to the uh, small-scale structure problem, and we'll finish up. Um, you know, these code comparisons are, are, are essential, really, for assessing the level of theoretical uncertainty in all of what we're trying to do here. Um, this, when you don't have fancy physics, if you just have shocks, the codes, uh, we've already learned that we should get rid of the old SPH implementations and promote these new uh, SPH implementations. That's important. Um, the full physics comparison demonstrates that we're nowhere near ready to, to claim that we've solved the galaxy formation problem with any of these methods yet. But um, you know, there's a question of, how, as we go forward, what do we do? I mean, we'll want to demonstrate convergence, i.e., change your numerical resolution and demonstrate that your solution doesn't change very much, if at all. Um, different codes with the same recipes for star formation and, and such should take the same initial conditions and produce the same results. So the, that, that Aquila code comparison should be done at some point in the future, and it should be done more carefully, and hopefully we'll see better convergence among different treatments. Uh, uniqueness will always be a challenge, i.e., if we think about that list of parameters that I showed you for star formation and feedback in ENZO, they're not independent in the sense that, you know, changing the star formation efficiency a little, uh, I can kind of combat, it will change the solution, but then I have another parameter that correlates with that parameter that I can shift to adjust back. And all of these parameters have you know, complicated correlated properties that mean that we're dealing with a kind of very complex nonlinear system uh, with a set of controls that are, that are very strongly coupled. And, we're gonna, and how do we validate? Again, we can't, I, 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 can, I can take a cold blob and drop it into a, uh, you know, I, I can take a, a blob of cream and drop it into my coffee and, and watch it. I can't form a galaxy in the lab, you know, literally, and watch it form. So how do we validate? Well, we can validate against the sky. And that means, uh, I'll talk a little bit more tomorrow, that means kind of we have to start pushing forward and promoting making synthetic imaging like we've seen from some of these simulations and really asking what kind of photons would I receive from that system and does it look like the photons I receive on the sky. Okay, let's finish up by going back to the small scale crisis with baryon feedback. So a couple of recent papers, Zolotov et al., and then I'll show you the fire results on the next slide. Uh, essentially, um, the original small-scale crisis problems were associated with going into just pure end-body simulations and tagging stellar properties onto subhalos. Well, now with baryon physics, you can actually see what's going on in the subhalos. And what goes on in some of these subhalos is they'll accrete a lot of baryons that will initially pull in a lot of dark matter uh, gravitationally, but then when the, when the stars explode and drive the baryons back out, it also unbinds the, 
but dark matter that's associated with the core of the system. And so show, what's shown over here is a density profile of what are called the most luminous and gas-free satellites at redshift zero in this calculation using the gasoline code. When you uh, just have dark matter only, you get density profiles that look like these blue lines. When you include the full uh, physics, you get density profiles that look like the black lines. So the densities are reduced substantially. Look, at this is an order of magnitude, right? Dens densities can, in the core can be reduced substantially. That brings down your circular velocity substantially as well, right? So uh, it solves both the too big to fail problem and the missing satellites problem in the sense that here is the number of systems, small systems in the Milky Way and Andromeda. Here's now in their new simulations with baryon physics, there's you know, reasonable agreement. Okay, and then uh, next to last slide, same thing for the fire simulations. Uh, missing satellites issue goes away again. Milky Way, Andromeda, what's called the latte simulation shown here. Um, and then it's very hard to see, but some, there's some, some thin lines to show you what would happen if you just had dark matter only, and that's shown here, right? So you can see how far off you were with dark matter only going from yellow to blue. Um, what would be nice, and what is nice, and, and this paper touches on it a little bit, is to get beyond the, the, uh, the attitude of I'm trying to tune my parameters to match observations to move forward into, okay, I've tuned parameters to match these observations, but now I'm going to predict something else, something I didn't tune for. And so you can see here that, um, well, here there was kind of tuned, if you will, to, to be able to produce this uh, circular velocity as a function of stellar mass. Um, observations are stars, simulations are, are open circle, or filled circles. It was good, reasonable agreement. But, you know, there was no real tuning. The metallicity kind of came in for free. Or it's, it's, it's put in with this lighter or 99, you know, starburst uh, model. And you can see that the observations and the simulations actually agree reasonably well in, uh, in metallicity versus uh, stellar mass. And that is, you know, that's moving more towards the predictive side. And as I said, there's, there's data galore out there about the local galaxy population. And so the more that we push harder on our models to, you know, okay, we've tuned over here, but now I'm going to look in this space where I haven't tuned and see how well I'm doing. You know, the more that we push in that direction and the more success we have in that new direction, that's, um, that's where, uh, also where this field is heading. Okay. So um, last slide, just to kind of summarize what we went over today. You know, in general, I would say that the field is in a somewhat adolescent phase. You know, it's just growing pains. We're trying to, end body methods are mature. They're stable. They're not going to change very much over the next few decades. Hydro methods in cosmological setting are very uh, young and will continue to evolve over, over the next uh, few decades. And that means that there's contributions to be made by folks like you in the room. Um, code comparisons are important to help move the field forward. And I think that you can, you know, the, uh, ultimately this, what, what ends up happening is, you know, you do simulations, a lot of complicated physics and a lot of, uh, a lot of parameters, a lot of things going on. But at the end of the day, we want to come up with a story, right? We want to come up with a story that might be something like, you know, we need warm dark matter in the universe. Uh, the small scale structure just doesn't work in lambda CDM. You know, you, we want a narrative. We want to understand something about the world around us. Uh, and uh, the hope w w is that uh, this small scale structure problem, that is to say, we look out in our galaxy, we see these small satellites, we have, they have properties uh, that we can measure well and we'll continue to measure even better as we go forward, that th those properties really do require the effect of baryon feedback and star formation, and that th this coupling between dark matter and gas is very important. And one way to address that will be to use gravitational lensing uh, on very small scales, including microlensing, to be able to uh, assess the graininess of the dark matter structure in galaxies. And so going forward, as we, as we develop uh, uh, techniques to be able to resolve that kind of structure in galaxies, that's again where simulations can make predictions now for what you should see. And uh, it'd be nice to actually make predictions that were then gone out and verified observationally, as opposed to getting the observations and then trying to work hard to match them in simulations. OK, so I think that's, uh, that's all I wanted to cover today. Uh, happy to take questions. And then we'll talk tomorrow about large scales and uh, galaxy clusters.